really, really warm welcome to Unexpected. Just so you know, um, practicalities wise, if there is an emergency, the exits you need are behind you on the way you came in um, and to the left and to the right too. But practicalities aside, Unexpected is here with a whole week of events giving us the chance to look at the claims of Jesus. And these lunch times in particular, we're going to be taking a really close look at the claims of the Christian faith, seeing whether or not they stand up to scrutiny. This lunch time, our topic is hope, can we really face suffering? So the way this is going to work is we're going to have a short talk and then there'll be time for questions afterwards. So do text in your questions at any point during the talk and the number that you need for that is on the pillars around the room. Um, any question you have, feel free to text it in. We're delighted to have Pete Dre here as our speaker. Pete usually works in the northeast of the country with the family of Christian unions, helping students to engage with the claims of Christianity. And he's going to be with us for all the lunch times. So please do join me in welcoming him up. Thank you. Do uh, keep coming in. Lovely to see some familiar faces from yesterday. Uh, lovely to see uh, others who I think probably weren't here yesterday as well. Uh, I'll speak for around 20 minutes. I'll try and give plenty of time for some questions afterwards as well. On a subject as big as this one though, we are only going to scratch the surface. And so let me just uh, make a couple of recommendations uh, right at the beginning. One is I really hope that you'll be able to come and join us in Cindy's afterwards. If you don't have to rush off to uh, do some work this afternoon. Uh, where we can maybe just dig into some of the issues in a bit more depth. Uh, together. Uh, if you come there, you can also pick up um, a free little book called How Can God Allow Suffering, which will dig in in a little more depth uh, than I'm able to just in, in what we say here. Well done for taking the time to be here this lunchtime. Uh, this issue is an emotive one, it's a universal one, uh, it's one that's ever present. There's a, a somber statistic that apparently every week, around the world, three academic works are published devoted to the issue of suffering. Suffering is permanently serious, permanently relevant. And today we're asking, how can we possibly face suffering? And I'm going to scrutinise some of the various ideas that might be put forward. I am speaking today as a Christian, and I am absolutely convinced that I see if we're to make any semblance of sense to the issue of suffering, then we need to bring the character of uh, Jesus of Nazareth into the equation. Now I realise that for many here, that isn't only unexpected, that is senseless. Why on earth would you want to bring God into the equation? If, if God is there, why would he put us through all of this? Don't suffering and pain make the existence of any kind of God that we would want to spend time with ridiculous. Now I want to start my time today by saying I believe that such a move to discard belief in God because of the existence of suffering is reasonable but misguided. I might put it like this, that atheism is understandable in a world of pain but it makes more sense as a visceral reaction than a settled position. Why is that? Because in a godless universe, there is no chance of hope or comfort whatsoever when it comes to suffering. Pain is rendered natural, it is rendered hopeless, comfort is removed, human suffering is normalised. We don't even have the right to rage against it if God exists. Christopher Hitchens, in an article in Vanity Fair called The Topic of Cancer, wrote beautifully and chillingly about the cancer that was killing him shortly before his death. He says this, he says, In one way, I suppose I have been in denial for some time, knowingly burning the candle at both ends and finding that it often gives a lovely light. But for precisely that reason, I can't see myself smiting my brow with shock or hear myself whining about how it's all so unfair. I have been taunting the reaper into taking a free side in my direction and I have now succumbed to something so predictable and banal, it bores even me. Rage would be beside the point for the same reason. Instead, he writes... 
I am badly oppressed by a gnawing sense of waste. Later in the article, he writes this, to the dumb question, why me? The cosmos barely bothers to return the reply. Why not you? Richard Dawkins, of course, put it like this. The universe we observe has precisely the properties we should expect if there is at bottom no design, no purpose, no evil and no good. Nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. But here's the conundrum. That very idea that nature is just red in tooth and claw delegitimates the idea of turning to atheism because of the existence of suffering. Do you see that? Because to complain against the existence of suffering and pain in the world requires us to assume that the world should really be pain-free and suffering-free. But if you hold that nature is blind and indifferent, that is not true. And so if you are an atheist here today and you are being fair to your beliefs, you have no ground for anger at the suffering and pain we see in the world. You can only hold, like Christopher Hitchens, a position of sad resignation, of gnawing waste. And so surprisingly, it's the experience of hatred at suffering that has actually led many people to believe in God. Andrea Pulpent Dilly is an author, and she was horrified by the suffering that she saw as she grew up in Africa as the daughter of uh, medical doctors there. And in the light of what she saw, her first reaction was to leave Christianity behind, but she came to see that the repulsion that she felt towards suffering and injustice requires God's existence. Here's how she tells her story. When people ask me about what drove me out of the doors of the church and then what brought me back, my answer to both questions is the same. I left the church because I was mad at God about human suffering and injustice and I came back to church for the same reason. I realised that I couldn't even talk about justice without standing inside of a theistic framework. To talk about justice, you have to talk about objective morality. And to talk about objective morality, you have to talk about God. And so here's the first unexpected turn. When we see or we suffer pain, it might seem viscerally reasonable to ditch God. But you still need to look this truth in the eye. That without God, you will still suffer, you will still die. It's just that suffering and death become ultimate realities. They are normalized. You have no right to rail against them. It's just the kind of universe we live in. Harold Blackham was based here in Cambridge. He was the former director of the British Humanist Society. He put it like this. The world is one vast tomb if human lives are ephemeral and human life is itself doomed to ultimate extinction. Now clearly we cannot reject an outlook just because it is miserable. But we do need to realise that the atheistic rendering of suffering reduces all suffering to be senseless and hopeless and wasteful. It can't ultimately achieve anything because you're a person who will die as part of a human race that will die in a planet that will die and so in the end suffering only ever keeps you from the things that you want the most and it always wins and so the atheistic view held consistently at least I think struggles to tell sufferers what to do when they suffer or to offer any hope that is at all authentic Now, I do not want to suggest for a moment that Christianity doesn't have difficult questions when it comes to suffering. And I've only got a few minutes now to even begin to open the door to the Christian answer. But I believe with my whole heart that the God of the Bible, that Jesus makes the best sense of human suffering and can offer us a true and tangible hope. 
We're not forced to take some kind of emotional escape from reality or to deny or to normalize the existence of suffering in the universe. If I speak personally for a moment, I have not suffered as much as many. Maybe not as suffered as much as some of the people in this room, but I have stood at the graveside of one of my best friends from school who was knocked off his bike when he was 17. I have had to sit with a close relative of mine who was attacked and raped on a night out in London. My wife and I have experienced four traumatic miscarriages. And so as I speak now, I want to speak not in the land of philosophy, but of real life and share two Christian convictions that have kept me going in the midst of those dark times. The first is this, that the God of the Bible empathises with our suffering. The Christian claim is that Jesus of Nazareth is God in the flesh. And because God took on human form and had the whole human experience, he has a first-hand experience of suffering. What I'd love you to do is to turn back to uh, page 23 um, in the copies of Luke's Gospel that you have. This is one of the earliest accounts of Jesus' life. If you were around last night, we're going to look again at the passage that that Nick brought us to uh, in, in the evening. On page 23, it's chapter 7. Here we see one of the ways in which Jesus encounters suffering. Elsewhere, he's described as someone who is acquainted with grief. As you read through the account, you'll see Jesus in pain and lonely and abused and grieving. He also saw suffering firsthand. And let's look at one instance now, looking from little number 11 at the top of the page. Soon afterwards, Jesus went to a town called Nain. And his disciples and a large crowd went along with him. As he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out. The only son of his mother. And she was a widow. And a large crowd from the town was with her. And when the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her. We'll leave it there for the moment. Now isn't this a tragic scene? A woman who has already lost her husband, has now lost her son. The Greek word suggests that he may well have been a teenager. This boy that this woman had brought into the world, whom she loved, maybe her own existing, only uh, uh, remaining family was now gone. And he's being taken to be buried when Jesus intercepts the funeral cortege. Do you notice Jesus' reaction in verse 13? We're told his heart went out to her. He is filled with compassion. Literally, the text says, he was moved to his bowels. He is affected in the very core of his being. We might say his heart breaks. The compassion that Andrea Palpant Dilly and others feel in the face of suffering and injustice and death is echoed in the heart of Jesus. Now, one of the problems, I think, is when it comes to the issue of suffering, we often turn to just thinking of God as the unmoved mover. He's distant. And let me say, I think there are plenty of gods whose existence or goodness is questioned by the fact that there is so much pain and suffering in the world. But if Jesus is God, can you see it cannot be said that he doesn't see or that he doesn't care when it comes to suffering in the world. Jesus looks at the woman, he sees her misery and his heart breaks. The Christian God isn't just some uninterested distant clockmaker who sets the cosmos whirring and then steps back to see what happens. He sees and he empathises. Read on in Luke's Gospel and you'll see that this isn't where Jesus' contact with suffering ends either. In fact, Jesus' story builds to his own crucifixion on a Roman cross. And this means an amazing thing. If your Christian friends are right and Jesus really is God, 
then the one true God is not immune to the suffering that any of us here is undergoing. Holocaust survivor Eli Wiesel wrote about a harrowing experience in a concentration camp. He says this, the SS hanged two Jewish men and a youth in front of the whole camp. The men died quickly, but the death throes of the youth lasted for half an hour. Where is God? Where is he? Someone shouted behind me. And as the youth still hung in torment in the noose after a long time, I heard the man call again, where is God now? And I heard a voice inside myself answer, where is he? He is here. He is hanging on the gallows. A theologian called Jürgen Moltmann heard this account and added this to Wiesel's account. He says this, any other account would be blasphemy because the Christian takes strength and courage that God suffers with us and enters even into our suffering. Particularly in the person of Jesus of Nazareth on the shameful, humiliating cross. A God who does not suffer is indifferent and would condemn human beings to indifference to Perhaps you are in real pain this lunchtime. Do you know what? It required quite a lot of courage even to come in here today when you heard the title. The Christian conviction is that God knows what it feels like. He sees. He is compassionate. And that leads to the second conviction which has kept me going as I suffer. His seeing leads him to action. Follow on again as we see what happens from verse 13. When the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her. And he said, don't cry. Then he went up and touched the bier that they were carrying him on. And the bearers stood still. He said, young man, I say to you, get up. And the dead man sat up and began to talk. And Jesus gave him back to his mother. Jesus sees the woman and he says these words that would surely have been intolerable had it had not been for what follows. Don't cry. And then Jesus stand, steps out in front of the pallbearers in the street and he dramatically brings the procession to a halt and then he touches the bier on which this dead boy is being carried. Not only is Jesus putting himself on the line, he is crossing the boundaries of Jewish ritual purity. He is making himself unclean as he touches it, the significance of which we'll think about shortly. And so Jesus sees this woman, he has compassion, then he reaches out and he touches for himself the very thing which is causing her grief. It's as if in reaching out to touch the beer, Jesus is claiming life for this boy who's been marked out for death. And do you notice no one asks Jesus to do this? He does it because he has compassion. Here is the Christian God relating to suffering humanity. Perhaps you're thinking, well, even if Jesus does enter into our sufferings with us, it hardly means anything unless he can do something. It's all very well God being empathetic. But we want more than just his tears. If he hasn't got the power to back it up, it doesn't go far. Having halted the funeral procession, in that liminal moment, Jesus addresses the dead boy. Young man, I say to you, get up. Sometimes hard to wake up teenagers, isn't it? But this teenager sits up and he starts talking. He's most definitely alive. And then maybe in the most tender part of this count at all, we're told that Jesus gives the boy back to his mother. The mother's own life, made so precarious by the death of her son, is made whole again. And what made it possible? Jesus' words and the fact that Jesus reached out his hand. Why would Jesus need to touch that beer? The equivalent of a coffin to be made unclean in order to raise this boy. We'll read on in Luke's Gospel and it's an enigmatic and deep symbol that if he is to offer hope to a suffering world, Jesus will take the root cause of this boy's suffering and death onto himself. 
If you've ever been at a graveside like I have when Ben was killed, you'll know how unnatural death feels in that moment. It feels as though there's been a rupture. And the Bible's answer is that that emotional intuition is correct, that, that in the most deep sense, death is unnatural. According to the Bible, there was once a day without suffering and death. And then the relationship between God and humanity was good, and that is the axis on which the cosmos turns. But when humanity, people like you and I, turned from God, the cosmos was knocked off its axis. And ever since then, there's been chaos and darkness in our hearts. I wonder if you see that. And there's been chaos and darkness in the natural world. The disorder of our own hearts is echoed in the disorder of the cosmos, deeply connected. And you know, when we turn from God, he didn't stop us. Instead, he pursued us into the darkness and the chaos. Jesus takes upon his, himself the darkness and the chaos to win us back. The biblical story is the story of the God who will pursue us even to the cross, even to hell, in order to win us back. He becomes unclean for us. That's the picture that we get in the story. He takes upon his own shoulders all of the evil that we have inflicted on the world, all of the pain that we've caused, all of the suffering we've induced in others in order to win us back. And he dies so that we have life. And the willing sacrifice that Jesus made at the cross is the Christian's demonstration, their assurance of the one true God's ultimate love for us. Whatever we've done, and whatever suffering we might currently be undergoing. Then on the third day, Jesus rose from his own tomb, never to die again. He took the death of death onto himself. He took the ultimate suffering upon his shoulders and then emerged out of his tomb unscathed into new life. So he is, as one writer puts it, like the needle that goes through the black shroud of suffering and death and comes out the other side. Jesus comes through suffering and death. He says to you this lunchtime, I can pull you through as well. There is life with me that cannot be marred by pain and death. And one day every atom of the cosmos will testify to that reality. I want to put it to you this lunchtime that if Jesus rose from the dead, then neither suffering nor death has the final say, as in the atheistic world. Because there is one who has a track record of triumphing over them. And so in my way as I've suffered, I've come to realise that as counterintuitive and as unexpected as it might first seem, I dare not abandon my hope in Jesus in the midst of pain. To do so is only to multiply my problems and to surrender any authentic comfort. And so the Christian conviction then is God cares about our pain, he shares in our pain, and he determines at his own cost to overcome our pain. But of course there's one question that's left, isn't there? Alright, if he's so willing to stop the pain and suffering, if he loves me, why doesn't he? Now maybe that's the hardest question of all. But there are clues in this passage, I think. Because once Jesus has raised this dead boy, Luke tells us that everyone at first was dumbstruck. Then they started shouting, praising God, saying things like, he's back. God is amongst us and he is looking after his people. And so in the most unexpected way, can't we say a certain good comes from the boy's death and his mother's grief? Jesus is presented with an opportunity to show that God was with them and for them. As he demonstrated his life-giving power even over death. Listen, atheism struggles to offer any way in which suffering can do anything which is ultimately positive. And yet this lunchtime we have seen two instances in which God was able to achieve something positive 
through suffering. He achieved something through the death of the widow's son. He achieved something through the death of Jesus himself. And those two examples alone should just check our pride, which says that just because we can't think of a good reason that God would allow suffering, that God can't think of one himself. And so as we suffer, we don't know the exact reason why God allows it to continue. And I realise that as the magnitude and as the depth of the cut increases, that question is magnified. But I want to suggest this once time that Jesus' own encounters with suffering can strengthen all of us as we suffer, whatever its nature. His example shows his compassion. His death shows his deep love for us. His word guarantees that all suffering is on borrowed time. And although we might want to know more about why God allows us to suffer as we are, I want to suggest that those convictions are sufficient to maintain tangible hope in the midst of suffering and also motivate us to compassionately alleviate suffering as we see it in others. As Christians have sought to do down the ages and as they seek to do today. So before we take questions, let me just ask you some final questions. Will you consider Jesus? Will you take the hour and a half to read this account of his life? And perhaps as you do so, you might ask yourself a couple of questions. In a world of pain, what evidence is there that Jesus cares? What evidence is there that he can do something about it? Can he offer you tangible hope? You may just find that your objections find resolution in the character and the work of Jesus. Why can't objective morality exist outside of um, a theistic framework? Uh, there's a guy, I think he was, maybe still is at Cambridge, called Arthur Allen Leff. If you study, is anybody here still study law? Is he still here? He might have died, I think. Uh, uh, um, he wrote a paper um, on this very issue. Um, I don't think he's a Christian, but he uh, wrote a paper which was called um, Whose Morality, Whose Rationality? And essentially, if we are to find some sort of basis for objectivity, it has to come outside of human experience. Because otherwise, the question just comes back to any form of moral frame that we, that we give. So too, who are you to decide? Even when it comes to a consensus amongst humanity on morality, we can just say, well, says who? Just think about British society, not even 50 years ago, really close to us, okay, in, when it comes to thinking about the length of civilizations and things like that. Aren't there all sorts of moral judgments that were the consensus in the 1950s or the 1960s that we would feel a little awkward about today? There are areas where we can find broad consensus of morality across, across human cultures, but even then there are plenty of disagreements. If we're to have universal, objective 
standards which lie outside of human experience, then they need to be given to humanity and not induced from within humanity. And that requires the existence of, of a God who speaks. Again, thank you. It's on facing the inevitability of suffering and death, hedonism seems like a possible response. Why not just make the most of life and die without regrets? That option is open to you. There are some problems with it though, aren't there? I can think of three. One is, if you live for hedonism and suffering invades your life, it's hard, very hard not to be bitter. If you've lived a hedonistic lifestyle and you develop multiple sclerosis, so that you can't live the hedonistic lifestyle that you want, I suggest that you will be left in a situation of very deep despair. That's one problem. Another one is, what do you say to the person who is suffering and who looks to you for words of authentic hope? A friend of mine was on a train the other day, a few months ago, and she met the mum of somebody that she knew at school, and so they were talking to each other, and she said, oh, I'm, I've not seen Frankie for a while, how is he? And the mother's face fell and, and had to say, oh, well, actually, he was, he was stabbed to death. And in that situation, my friend, as the conversation went on, the mother basically said, look, I'm struggling to find hope. If you are living for hedonism, what do you say? To that suffering person? What resources do you draw upon? And then of course the third one is if we are living in a universe which truly is made and crafted by the kind of God that we've been looking at today, isn't it the biggest act of folly and the biggest act of arrogance to turn your back on the hope that he's offering you and to say, well actually I'd rather eat, drink and be married. That is folly of the greatest magnitude, isn't it? And so for those reasons, I want to say, when it comes to objective reality, it falls short. When it comes to personal experience, it falls short. And when, as all of us will, at some point in our life, people will turn to us and will say, give me a reason for hope, what are you going to say? I just think here, this is another place where the Christian description of suffering is not only objectively trustworthy but also gives us emotional resources to be able to push through and to serve others in the midst of their suffering as well. Brilliant, thank you. Maybe last one. If God created everything, then did, did he create suffering and if so, why? This is a difficult question. The Bible would say that God did create everything but he did not create suffering, he did not create evil. And so as I said, when humanity turned its back on God, he didn't prevent humanity from walking away from him. We don't know why exactly. There are, there are things that you can induce and deduce from that, and, and maybe if this is your question, we can talk about some of those afterwards. What he does do is greater still, which is that he pursues us in the midst of our suffering and our evil. He demonstrates his love for us and so transforms our existence that we can know him in a way that we couldn't have possibly ever known. Have we not, um, have we not experienced his love in that way? I could say more, but I think I'm gonna stop there. I, I realize that's a very short answer. If you want to talk further, this question requires a long answer. So do come across to Cindy's. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Pete. Um, I'm afraid that's all we've got time for now. We're going to have to leave this building quite quickly. Um, but as Pete said, um, all this week we're hosting a cafe in Cindy's with free tea and coffee from now until four. So do head over there um, if you want to talk about this or any other question, or just as a chance to hang out over tea and cake. Pete will be there and he'd love to carry on that conversation with you. And um, they'll also be there. Uh, oops. Um,
Well, these little books, um, How Can God Allow Suffering? That's free for you to take away. It's a really short read, but a great way to get us started to think about these questions. I'll be at the cafe and I'll look for other books to help you think more on this and other subjects. Um, so, as you leave now, make sure that you've got the flyers, which will give you details about everything that's going on this week. And feel free to, to take away um, Luke's account of, John, of Jesus' life, so you can have a read on it.